climate change. And for further information, please visit our website. This seminar is part of a series of seminars, so please check the chat functions with the link to our series advertised on Eventbrite and our Twitter feed, our website, for more information. Before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to remind participants of the seminar etiquette. Please ensure that your cameras and microphones are switched off for the duration of the seminar. The presentation will take about 20 minutes during which please use the chat function addressed to everyone with your questions. At the end of the presentation, there will be a 10 minute question and answer session during which I will collate questions from the chat function uh, and share these uh, with the speaker to reply. And may I remind everybody that the seminar is being recording and according will be made available via YouTube. Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Pippa Chapman is professor of biogeochemistry at the School of Geography, University of Leeds, and works in the interdisciplinary field of land and water management. Her research focuses on how land use and climate change affect soil processes, nutrient cycling, greenhouse gas fluxes, water quality, and the provision of ecosystem services. Within these areas, particular emphasis has been placed on understanding the factors controlling the long-term increase in surface water dissolved organic carbon, the impacts of peatland restoration on gaseous and aquatic carbon fluxes, and the role of land management on carbon storage in agricultural soils. Since 2015, Professor Chapman has been involved in several research projects at the University of Leeds Farm, which aims to create more resilient and sustainable farming systems. She has experience of building strategic partnerships with stakeholders, and she's led knowledge exchange activities and events to deliver maximum impacts. She is currently the water quality lead for the Yorkshire Integrated Catchment Solutions Program, ICASP, a six million pound NERC funded program, which aims to generate benefits for Yorkshire by applying environmental science to catchment challenges. Pippa, we're really pleased to have you with us today. I'll pass the floor over to you for your presentation. Oh, thanks, Steve, very much for the introduction. Um, can we just go back a slide? Oh, back, not forward. Uh, and again, right, thank you, right, no, forward one. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. And I would just like to thank you, the Global Food and Environment Institute for inviting me to give this talk today. And as Steve said, it coincides with World Saw Day that happened on Saturday and it's an annual event. And it's really there to um, focus our, our attention on the importance of soil and consider all the key functions they perform. The most of important of which is food production. And there is a, a phrase I like to start some of my lectures with especially, um, and it is that despite man's accomplishments, we owe our existence to the fact that we have a 30 centimeter layer of soil on our planet and that it rains a lot. And so the big question, I suppose, is why have we not valued or looked after our soils considering the functions that they provide for us? And a recent uh, report by the United Nations has highlighted that a third of our soils are severely degraded and that deforestation, overgrazing, and poor agricultural management have been identified as the key threats. So in this talk today, I'm going to really um, talk about the role of soil organic matter and why we need to conserve it and increase it to ensure that our soils are healthy and resilient. And I think when we think about soil, this photo is what we generally probably have in our minds. But soils are not homogeneous. In fact, they're very heterogeneous. And the next slide really highlights this. Um, in England and Wales alone, there are over 700 different types of soil. And that reflects the variation in geology, climate, topography, vegetation, and time. And so this means the properties of soil are very different. And this just shows you or highlights a few of those 700 soil types that we have. These photos are taken from Devon. And what you 
really realise that soils come in different colours and different forms. Here we can see that some soils are very shallow. This soil here is probably a few 10 to 20 centimetres in depth and it's formed over chalk and limestone, whereas other soils are very deep. Some soils are stony, others not so stony. And um, if we can see the next, um, next slide, please. And soil colour is really due to two main factors. It's to do with the amount of soil organic matter that a soil has. And you can see here to the left are some soil samples, different shades of brown. And the darker the soil, generally the more soil organic matter it contains. And once you burn off the soil organic matter and remove it, it displays the colours of the soil particles, which we can see on the right hand side. And we can see that soil particles vary from quite pale particles through to shades of orange and red and brown. And so the organic matter often hides the colour part, the particles of the minerals that have come from the weathering of the bedrock. And soil's really made up of four main components, and the pie chart really shows this. And that the majority of soil, 45% of soil, is made up of these mineral particles that come from the weathering of bedrock. And actually, generally in most soils, only a small proportion of it is organic matter, usually around five, six percent. And then 50 percent of soil is made up of pores or spaces between the soil particles. And those spaces are filled with either air or water, depending on the recent weather conditions. So where does the soil organic matter come from? And we can see this in the next slide. So organic matter comes really from, the majority of it comes from the dead plant material that returns to the soil surface. And we call this litter. And in the top left-hand side, you can see a leaf litter that's accumulated on the surface of the soil. And this is a major uh, proportion of the organic matter that's returned to soil. But there are other sources, such as <clears throat> that from animals that's returned to the soil surface. We can also make composts, and here we can see a garden or household compost. There's also the living and dead biomass that occurs below the soil surface. And here we can see roots can be living or dead and they contribute to organic matter to the soil. We also have macrofauna, such as worms, and microfauna, such as bacteria and fungi, which are also really important at decomposing that organic matter and releasing the nutrients required for plant growth. So this is the different forms of organic matter, but what controls how much organic matter we see in soils? And that we can see in the next slide. <clears throat> oh, okay. We're looking at the different functions that organic matter. So despite only representing a small proportion of soil, organic matter really has a big impact on the soil properties. It influences soil structure. And that is, it's really important in holding all the soil particles together. And this reduces soil erosion. Organic matter is really important in absorbing water. It helps infiltration and it attenuates runoff. And it also stores lots of nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus. And organic matter can hold between 10 to 100 times more water and nutrients than mineral particles. So really important in controlling soil fertility. Soil organic matter can also help retain pollutants within the soil and stop them reaching surface waters and groundwaters. For instance, it helps retain pesticides. But most important again is organic matter is a source for all the soil organisms that live within our soil. About 25% of all biodiversity on the planet actually lives within soils. But actually we can't see most of that. So perhaps we don't realize how much biodiversity there is in our soil. And as these microorganisms break down the organic matter, that's the energy they use to live on and they release the nutrients that the plants need to grow. 
but together the organic matter, which is made up of between 50 and 60% carbon, the rest is made up of oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen and phosphorus, means that it's a really important terrestrial store of carbon. Global soil carbon pool is about 2,500 petrograms, and this is about three times more than the carbon that occurs in the atmosphere, and about four times more than the carbon that's present in the living plants and animals on our globe. So it's really important that we make sure that the carbon stays in our soils and doesn't escape into the atmosphere and contribute to climate change. So let's have a look at the factors that control how much organic matter um, is stored in our soils. It's all to do with looking at the amount of organic matter that's inputs to the soil and this is from the plant dead plant material which is called litter and the amount of plant material in a location is controlled by climatic controls and management and then once the organic matter is incorporated into the soil it either stays within the soil as organic matter or it's returned to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide and the factors that control the decomposition of this soil organic matter is the climate and in particular temperature and the water content of the soil. So where our soils are in warmer climates, the decomposition rate is faster. And when our soils are in wetter environments and when we have anaerobic conditions where they could be waterlogged, the decomposition rate is slower. The soil texture is also really important in controlling how much carbon is retained within the soils. So soils that have a high proportion of clay and iron and aluminium minerals retain more soil organic matter than say, for instance, sandy soils. And so where we've got inputs that are greater than outputs, the soil organic matter builds up. Whereas when we have outputs that are bigger than inputs, the soil organic matter can uh, decline. And in natural ecosystems, over time, the inputs and outputs can equal each other and the organic matter is in equilibrium and does not change. So let's have a look at how agriculture has had an impact on soil organic matter. In the next slide, please. So this is um, a picture of some soil samples we've taken from the University of Leeds farm. And we've taken soil from beneath the hedgerows, uh, beneath uh, from the grassy strip that surrounds an arable field, and then two meters and 32 meters into an arable field. And um, what you should notice is that there's some differences, or, or what do you notice about the different soils as we move from the hedge soils into the arable field? There's two key differences that you should be able to notice about the soils and how they vary. So the first one is as we move from the soil um, on the left hand side, which is under the hedge, out into the arable field, the soil colour becomes lighter. Um, and also you'll notice that the soil structure varies. The soil is quite crumbly under the hedge, whereas out in the arable field, it's more consolidated. And if I was to have a watering can now and just drip a little bit of water over these soils, you would notice that the rate at which that water infiltrates varies and will be quicker um, under the hedge compared to the arable field where you might see ponding of water on the surface due to a slower rate of infiltration. And the reason why we can see these visual differences in the soil is related to differences in the soil organic matter content of these soils, which we can see in the next slide. So here you can see the soil organic carbon contents. And despite um, there only being a little bit over 1% difference in the organic carbon content between the hedge and the arable soil, we can see that they give really different visual uh, impacts on the soil in terms of both the colour and the soil structure. 
So what else might this difference in soil organic carbon have an impact on? So if what we did here is we planted some wheat seeds into um, these uh, soils and monitored their growth. So in which soil do you think we saw the highest uh, yield of wheat? I think you can actually see it from, from this angle, but in the next slide, you can see this picture from a slightly different angle. And here you can see that there's some <coughs> really clear differences in above ground yield. And actually the difference in uh, yield between the uh, above ground biomass in the wheat is about 70% higher in that grown in the soil that we took from the woodlands compared to the soil that we took from the arable field. So we can see that this soil and the soil organic matter and carbon content is having a really big impact on some of these soil properties that influence yield. So do you want to have a look at the next uh, slide? So here we're just summarizing the impact of agriculture on soil organic matter. So, so agricultural practices have basically led to a decline in the input of organic matter to soils. And this is because we remove the above ground biomass by harvesting the crop and also by grazing. And the more animals that graze, the more biomass they remove and less is returned to the soil. And also certain practices such as plowing that we can see here on the right hand side and uh, artificial drainage increase the decompos decomposition rate of the soil organic matter that does get into the soil. And therefore we've been returning CO2, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And so what we've actually been ha happening over the last few hundred years as outlined on this diagram on the right bottom is as we've taken soil from its natural state and begun to cultivate it, we've been releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, contributing to climate change and reducing the soil organic matter uh, in the soil, which as I've highlighted in the previous slides, have all these really important properties that uh, help reduce soil erosion, have an impact on plant yield. And we've come to a point now where we have quite a large carbon debt in our soils the value here of 40 to 90 uh, petrograms is, is debatable, but it's a large deficit. And I suppose the question is, can we reverse this deficit? Can we now change our agricultural practices and draw down the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store it as soil organic matter within our soils? And this is the big question. And this is known as carbon sequestration. You can see in the next slide. So there are a range of different management practices that would lead to an increase in organic matter inputs and a decrease in decomposition rates. And so a reduction in our release of carbon dioxide from the soils back to the atmosphere. And this is just a few examples of some of these practices that um, are being taken up in, in greater proportions currently through the uh, agricultural sector. So it's things like increased use of cover crops, including trees in arable and grazing uh, systems, returning more organic matter and amendments to our, so our soils, reducing stocking densities and incorporating uh, crop res residues um, into the soil. And also uh, shown here on the photo, Rather than uh, conventional ploughing, which you saw in the, the previous slide, uh, many farmers are now reduce the amount of tillage or disruption they make to the soil, uh, or even direct drilling the seeds into the soil. And here you can see that the, the previous crop, crop residue is still present in the soil and the seeds are being drilled directly into this soil. So we have less disturbance, uh, we're keeping the soil covered and we're reducing the loss of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere and increasing the amount of soil organic matter into the soil. 
and this can partly mitigate uh, climate change. And um, in 2015, at COP21 in Paris, there was an initiative uh, called uh, Four Per Mill that is really um, aiming to increase uh, the soil organic matter content of globally, across the globe, on an annual basis by 0.4%. So in the next uh, slide, what we've been doing at the University of Leeds over the last few years is looking at how some of these changes in agricultural practices have an impact on soil organic matter and many other soil properties. Um, and I'm just gonna talk to you a little bit about a few of those projects that we've been carrying out. So here you can see uh, two soil samples on the left-hand side. And I suppose my question to you is, do you think they're taken from the same field? And I suppose I've, by giving you a picture on the right hand side, many of you might be saying yes. But what you see is that they're very different soil structure. And actually these soil samples were taken only a meter or so apart. But one was taken from this grassy strip of, um, that you can see in the right hand side picture, which is, um, a strip of grass and clover that was planted into the arable field to see whether using these what we call lay strips could improve soil health and make it more resilient to climate change. And then the other soil sample has been taken from the soil beneath the winter wheat. And this grass strip had been in place for about three years, just uh, under three years when we, we took this picture and so you can see that changing the land management, changing the crop even, can have quite a big impact on the soil structure visually. But we also measured some of the soil properties, and I've just highlighted a few here beneath the photos. Um, and what we found was that the um, earthworms in the, the soil beneath the grass uh, increased by nearly 40% in comparison to in the arable field. And we found several of the hydrological properties also increased in the grass strip compared to the arable field. The amount of water at field capacity that the soil could, help, could hold was increased by nearly 10%. And the hydro hydrological conductivity was almost five times higher in the um, lay strip compared to the arable crop. And we did see a 10% increase in soil organic carbon in the lay strip compared to the arable, but this was not statistically uh, significantly different. And this highlights some of the issues of actually being able to um, monitor a change in soil organic carbon over the short term as a result of some of these changes in um, agricultural practices. So in another project, as well as this project, which we can see in the next slide. We've been looking at the impacts of planting hedges on uh, sequestering carbon. And this was carried out in both the Saw by Hedge project, which was with Sheffield, York and Leeds, and this resilient dairy project, which was with Newcastle, Leeds and Liverpool. And here I've just presented um, a few uh, uh, of the results, which shows the soil organic matter content in the mainly uh, intensive grass and fields in red and comparing it to the soil organic matter taken from hedges of different ages. So we've got some very young hedges that have just been planted in the last few years. We've got hedges that have been in place for about 10 years, some other hedges that are nearly 40 year old and then some very old hedges that have been there longer than the farmers can remember. And what we can see in the table below is just the mean concentration of soil organic matter in the top 50 centimetres of the soil. And what you can see is that their organic matter content in the, in the grass and fields is about six and a half percent, whereas under the old hedges, it's uh, just over 10 percent. But what we can see is that even in the, the hedges that have nearly been there for 40 years, the organic matter content is considerably greater 
I think it's about 130% greater under the hedges compared to in the field. And this gives a, sequ a sequestration rate of organic matter of about 0.06% increase in soil organic matter each year in the soil beneath the hedges um, in compar comparison to the field. And what, we remember, what we must need to remember as well is that carbon is also stored in the above ground um, vegetation in the hedges as well. And we're currently looking at quantifying that in order to look at the total carbon sequestration rate of planting hedges within agricultural systems. And then lastly, we have another project called Locked Up. And this is a project with the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, uh, Lancaster and Sheffield, where we're looking at why does some soil organic matter uh, persist in the soil for thousands and thousands of years, whereas other organic matter rapidly decompose and doesn't stay stored within the soil for very long. And I know this is a very busy slide, but what I was trying to um, highlight is that for many years, we thought that the storage of soil organic matter was related to the molecular structure of that soil organic matter. But over the last 10, five, 10 years, there's been a shift in our understanding of how organic matter is stored within the soil. And it's very much related to uh, the microbial population or the biotic processes interacting with abiotic processes. And what the diagram on the left shows is that as we introduce plant material into the soil, the microbial population decomposes that material and produces smaller and smaller compounds. But as these compounds are uh, produced, there's the potential for them to be protected from further microbial degradation by either interaction with the mineral surfaces, particularly of iron and aluminium, or by protection through the formation of soil aggregates. Um, and this is the way in which soil particles are all joined together. And the, the picture on the right tries to show you what a soil aggregate looks like. And we can see the small particles of, of clay and silt, which are made up of the iron and aluminium minerals on which the organic matter, which is highlighted as POM, particulate organic matter in this diagram, can be absorbed onto. And then all the green microbes and viruses trying to decompose that organic matter. And then these small microaggregates become bigger aggregates. And when they're bigger, the microbes can't access these small microaggregates in the same way. And so the soil organic matter can be protected from degradation, but these aggregates form and decompose and the organic matter can absorb and desorb. And so there's a continual cycle of decomposition and interaction with the abiotic and biotic um, processes going on. And that's what we're looking at in this project. We're investigating how biotic and abiotic processes interact to control soil carbon stabilization, but more importantly, persistence to make sure the organic matter stays in the soil and isn't released to the atmosphere. So lastly, I just want to summarize some of the things that I've talked about here. But although it's quite hard to quantify soil organic carbon sequestration rates currently, as we know that they vary both spatially and temporally for different types of soil, different climatic zones, what we do know is there's some simple steps we can take to improve the soil health we have. And these are by minimizing soil disturbance, ensuring the soil is kept uh, covered and not bare, particularly in winter, avoiding compaction, reducing pesticide use, increasing plant diversity, and even including livestock within mainly arable systems. And these steps can all improve soil health. And we know that soil health has a number of benefits. And those benefits include food security, storing and filtering water, hosting a lot of plant, uh, planet, of our planet's biodiversity, and making our soils more resilient to climate change, as well as in the short term, 
being able to help mitigate climate change. So I thought I'd leave you uh, with the last little key fact for the day. This is taken from um, the Global Soil Carbon Map. And this just highlights that actually 10 countries in the world store more than 60% of our soil organic carbon stock. And if we look at those countries, as we might imagine, many of them are very big, but also many of these countries are undergoing quite rapid land use change. For instance, Brazil and Indonesia, where deforestation is occurring. And countries like Russia and Canada are seeing rapid climate change and melting of the permafrost. So I think it would be good to say in 10, 50, 100 years time, do these Will these countries still be storing 60% of our global soil organic carbon stock? Thank you, and I'm happy to take some questions. Great, thank you, Pippa. Um, for those of you who uh, need to get away to uh, your next uh, activity in the day. Um, many thanks for joining us. We'll stay on for a few minutes here to take some questions from the chat group. Um, Pippo, one of our first questions was, could I, could I ask whoever has their mic on to make sure your mics are off other than the speaker and the chair? Uh, thank you. Um, the first question is that the UK uh, is predicted to have, uh, for its climate projections, are predicted to have higher temperature, which will reduce organic matter by accelerating decomposition, but also more intense rainfall in the summers that could reduce decomposition. Is it known what the overall projection is on UK soil, soil organic matter change for the next few decades? Well, as you know, there, there's, there's d different ways in which climate change can have an impact, just like the, the, the person who wrote this said, of course, if we warm up, uh, temperatures increase, then yes, it will increase decomposition rates, but also if we increase growing season, we could increase uh, plant productivity and perhaps return more organic matter to the soils. So there's different ways it can go and a lot of research is currently being under, is currently undergoing to look at this and model the impact of climate change on soil organic carbon content. And just as you said, the extremes, uh, drought and uh, flooding also have an impact on this. Uh, just a quick reply to that. Does that, from your answer then, does, do you view then that how we farm and use soil will actually be more important to the, the yeah. fate of organic matter than what climate does? Yeah, I think that, that, that you've hit on it right there, Steve. I think that to make our soils more resilient to climate change, it's really important that we change the way in which we manage them to make them more resilient and try and increase the soil organic matter content as much as we can. Okay. There was a question about one of the research projects, the results on the grass lay strips, mm -hmm. and you showed the two blocks of soil um, that were very different. And the question is for how long was the grass strip in place before those soils were sampled? Yeah, it was almost three years. And also the same- So that big, of a, that big of a difference in soil just within three years? Yeah. Okay. So just following up on that then, do I take it then that the more granular friable soil, which came from the grass strip, that that, that soil looked like that hard block of soil in the other hand, yeah, it did. just three years earlier? Absolutely, that soil in that field all looked very similar and it looked like that very consolidated block, yeah, building block of soil. Um, and then basically by planting the grass and clover, clover in those strips, we had quite a lot of strips, I just showed you one, the, the structure changed, it was much more rooty, and yeah, the visual difference is, is really quite stark. There was a, a follow-up to that, which is a statement that uh, I was missing the fact that plants exudate a lot of carbon into the soil via the roots. 
it's not just the root biomass itself. Do you want to comment on that a little bit? Yes, and I, I yes, I didn't actually make that clear. Very true. Um, that as plants are growing, they basically um, exchange uh, nutrients from the soil, take nutrients off via their roots, but they also exudate organic compounds into the soil. And that's a very important source of organic matter. Um, it's a source that actually is very rapidly uh, decomposed by the um, microbial population within the soil, but yes. Uh, I'll take a couple more questions and then we'll finish for the day. Uh, the next one is, what can we do day to day to help soil organic matter and reduce carbon output in our gardens and fields and in our local countryside as well as across the planet? You had a few points there in that last slide, but maybe you could comment a little further on that. Yeah, really important questions. I don't know if any of you saw Country File a few weeks ago, they were talking about this and showing what we could do. The emphasis was very much on planting trees, but there was a little bit in there about what you could do in your own allotment, in your own garden. And actually a colleague of mine that, that used to teach with me has been doing just that. And it's basically trying not to disturb your soil as much. Don't need to turn it over. Try planting directly into the soil with as little disturbance as possible. Composting, you know, you've got leaves coming down perhaps into your garden compost them yourself at home, return that compost to the soil rather than uh, removing those leaves and, and sending it in your recycling bin. These are little things we can do in our garden to, to try and build up that soil organic matter. Okay, and then I, uh, I'll take uh, the last question. It's quite an interesting one. Uh, the comment is very super interesting about soil organic matter increases with the different interventions. However, a lot of these will reduce yields, such as reducing stocking rates, taking land out of production for periods, and so on. Well, will that mean more natural habitats are need to be converted to produce the lost food, given that soils and natural habitats have much higher levels of organic matter and carbon than agricultural soils? It seems that the benefits you gain could be offset by this conversion. Has there any been any work done uh, been done looking at this trade-off? I think, you know, these are really important things to look at. And, you know, like I showed you, though, in that, um, that experiment where we planted uh, wheat into different soil types, you actually get higher yields where you've not deteriorated the soil organic matter so much. So even though, you know, we could get higher yields in our fields where soil organic matter has declined if we can increase it, I think we need to remember that um, we waste about a third of all the food that's produced. So again, things that we can do individually is reduce our food waste and therefore we shouldn't, wouldn't have to produce so much um, food if we, if we did that. I think, you know, we don't want to be taking land uh, out of, you know, deforesting any more land than we already do. I mean, there's many, much debates about our diets, um, there's, it's, it's a big debate and I think we all need to be taking more uh, of a role in it and listening to it because what we eat has an impact, and what we buy and eat has an impact on the, on the globe and we need to try and minimize that. Great, thank you very much. I'm gonna stop Q&A there. Um, I just wanna thank Pippa again. Uh, it's been fantastic, great talk, great topic and thank you for helping uh, all of us raise awareness and celebrate soil and World Soil Day this year. Um, uh, Pippa just co-authored a fantastic blog on regenerative agriculture, and you can check that out, the link to it uh, in the Institute's Twitter feed. And uh, just remains to thank all the participants for joining us today. Uh, had a tremendous turnout for the talk, reflecting, I think, recognition of your expertise and the interest in the subject Pippa, and just that our next seminar from the Global Food and Environment Institute will be Wednesday, the 24th of February. And get the details on our website and on Eventbrite. So thank you, everybody, and have a great remainder of the day, and uh, have great holidays. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for taking the time to, to listen to this talk. Much appreciated.
We'll finish the